a number of studies that show if you have a protein surplus and a calorie deficit, you lose body fat and gain muscle mass at the same time. So that's all anybody really needs to know. And that aligns with everyone's goals. Nobody goes to their trainer and says, you know, I really like to be fatter and weaker. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> like they all want to be leaner and strong. So yeah. protein surplus in calorie deficit. So like when I do four doses of Fortigen, that's 200 grams of protein. And, you know, I get another 50 or 100 with, uh, with meat at dinner. I don't really need anything else, but my entire, you know, calorie consumption in a day might be a thousand calories. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I am super fired up today to have the one and only Dr. John Jaquish join me today. Uh, Dr. Jaquish, I just want to start by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Thanks, Nick. I'm excited. Let's, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's get started. Start grilling yeah. me. Very difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> start, start grilling you. No, so uh, it is funny, right? When, right before, um, or before hopping on here, you know, I've wanted to... Not in every scenario, but like there's a lot of things in, in your book that I definitely agree with. There's nothing, not anything that I, you know, definitely disagree with because uh, I haven't done all the research and the science and stuff that that you've done. But there are certain things that almost and, and some of the things that I want to disagree with that I want to take almost the devil's advocate um, perspective and just ask some of the questions, even if I don't even believe in some of the things that I'm asking. But um, so I'm excited to get into today. So. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I picked a, a bunch of, yeah, I, through the years, people are, are like, I don't understand, like, wh where did you come from? Like, like, no one's heard of you in the fitness industry, right? Because I'm not in the fitness industry. Yeah. I've been in the medical device industry for 10 years, though. Yeah. Uh, so I developed a medical device that treats osteoporosis, grows bone uh, faster than any drug that's ever been trialed, and there's no side effects. It's called OsteoStrong. So that research pointed out a few things to me about fitness that really showed standard weightlifting was a terrible stimulus for trying to grow muscle. It was a much mm -hmm. better way that was obvious to me, but I'm a scientist, so it wouldn't be obvious to a lot of people. And it obviously isn't obvious because a lot of people uh, are, are sort of pushing hard against it or are detractors. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it's okay. There's dumb as turnips. Uh, the science, <laughs> the product is very elegant, uh, and so uh, the vast majority of people are, are picking up on it and using it and getting great results. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And and honestly, what you said in the beginning is one of the biggest reasons why people should give you credibility and people should listen because you're not in the fitness industry. You're coming from like the bi biomedical side, and when you created the product. You didn't really have, you know, this financial motivation. It was from, I just literally want to create something that helps me and helps people actually grow muscle efficiently. And then same thing with the, um, y'all's, um, protein kind of a supplement. I don't, I don't know as much about that, but you know, that's from the point of view of, I'm not coming from the nutrition industry. I want to create something that actually, um, is beneficial, but to kind of give everybody people a little bit of context. Um, obviously you're the author of weightlifting is a waste of time. So is cardio and there's a better way to have the body you want. Um, definitely a attention grabber title, which I love. Um, but basically the general concept, if I had to boil it down to one sentence, one sentence of your book is that variable resistance and hormonal stimulation are the keys to optimal muscle growth and fat loss. Um, and so kind of, Starting with that, I want to go on the, the physical fitness side of things and just have you start off by describing to everybody what variable resistance is. It's a resistance that changes as you move. Now, there can be different reasons for that. Uh, but my reasoning is so that load is delivered where the, the user has the capacity to deliver it. So load changes with capacity, thereby fatiguing the muscle to a more significant degree and stimulating more growth. And the more intense the stimulus, the greater the adaptive response always. Yeah. And so to give people a exercise um, 
Example, you know, you always talk about the, the the bench press is one of the easiest ones to f- figure out. You know, at the, at the bottom of a bench press, when the bar is close to your chest, you don't have the ability to create as much force. And you've talked about the science of there's a seven fold differential between the amount of force that you can deliver from that weakest range of motion from the strongest range of motion, the strongest range of motion of a bench press being like right before uh, the top, right before kind of el- elbow extension, if you will. Um, and so... Talk a little bit more about, maybe not too deep into the science, but talk a little bit more about kind of when you discover that and how big of like an eye opener that was. It's when I, so the, the, the way the medical device works, it compresses bone and optimized positions. So these optimized positions are the positions that one would assume when absorbing high impact forces. So like, uh, 120 degree angle between upper arm and lower arm so like that right and so you can either either absorb or produce the greatest amount of force with that geometry Mm -hmm. and so that was so much bigger of a force than than we're used to that people use uh and when I looked at what average lifts are, according to the NAMES database, uh, it's a database of 20,000 people, has all kinds of health metrics. It's the largest in the, in the world that's main, maintained by the Institute of Health, uh, part of the U.S. government. So using that as a as sort of a starting point, what are the average loads that people are using? And then what are they doing with my medical device? And it was seven times different. And so it's like, okay, like this just tells me that as people are, they, they, have, they choose a weight for the weakest position. Yeah. So I don't have to wonder what that is. It's whatever they're lifting is what they can handle in their weakest position. And that's what I got from the NAs database. And then from a maximum perspective, it was it was a sevenfold difference. Yeah. So like right away, it's just like weightlifting is not a great way to stimulate because we just have so much capacity, but we don't use it. Yeah. Ever. Weights cannot do it. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't make sense to pick up a static weight if there's a variable alternative. Right. So you got to ha- impose more load where you're stronger and less load where you're weaker. It, Peter Tia said it before I came out with anything. He was thinking the same thing. He says, you know, I really don't like weightlifting. And you know, Dr. Tia. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure he is. Oh, okay. He's super famous. He's been okay. like every you know, 20 times yeah. talking about how he's, he's probably one of the most famous uh, like television physicians. Um, he, he says, he said it a few times that he doesn't really like weightlifting because it overloads joints and underloads muscle. And, you know, look at the results of people who have been bench pressing for years. Some of them can't hold a coffee cup yeah. without pain. So gotcha. Gotcha. So to kind of describe variable resistance, maybe, you know, a little further, like you said, it's distributing the weight differently depending on the range of motion. So on the weaker ranges of motion, you're giving having to pr- pr- uh, produce less force, and on the stronger ranges of motion, being able to produce more force. Um, and so, you know, with your with your product with X3, with the if you're doing a, a chest press when the when your elbows are back and your handles are right by the chest, and you're having to produce less force, but then as you go out and press out, you're actually having to produce m- more force. So it's the the variable amount of uh, resistance that you're given. So in fitness, are there other ways that are currently out there? Or what are the other ways that are currently out there that provide a similar sort of variable resistance outside of maybe your product? There are some. Most right. gyms don't allow them. Like you see chains on the end of a bench press bar. And I mean, I'm talking about a huge, huge, like anchor a a cruise ship kind of chain. Um, So you pick up more of the chain as you move the bar away from yourself. Right. Uh, That's variable resistance. I think it's kind of clumsy and kind of dangerous. 
but that is a way of doing it. Now there are people who add banding to weight, but there's a study that I referenced in my book, and I believe it's the last variable resistance reference. So it would be the 16th reference in the book uh, where it talks about uh, the greater degree of variance is going to yield a greater response by the body than a lesser degree. So like, for example, like some people, Westside Barbell, they'll put some small bands on the end of a, of a bar. Now they're training for the sport of the bench press. Yeah. So, you know, like when I say one rep maximums are stupid and well, not for those guys, because that's their actual sport. Yeah. So like, but one rep maximums for everybody who's not training there, who doesn't know what they're doing. No, they shouldn't do that. That's mm -hmm. just stupid as a drinking game. Um, just yesterday, uh, somebody, uh, there's a video that was going around. Somebody uh, snapped their pack full tear all the way through uh, in this trans press video. And Larry Wheels was spotting the guy. I don't know who the guy is, but the spotter I definitely recognized. And um, yeah, it's just like, why? Why go through the risk if there's a better way? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's my argument against uh, against weight training. Like, you're going to get almost no result out of it. Uh, you, the body is not set up for stimulus like this. And then you're going through huge risks, too. Yeah. Especially when you get stronger. Like, like if you're one of those few who actually gets stronger, because remember, most people go to the gym and get nothing. They don't get stronger. They don't look any different year after year. And this is like, I have data to back this up. This is like 99% of the population that walks into a gym. Never. Yeah. It's jack shit. So I don't know why we're defending the industry in the first place. It's probably the most failed human endeavor. But um, using that variable resistance, it takes the biomechanical disadvantages away. Yeah. Now, in the last chapter of the book, and this might be the most important point, and I didn't think so, but I mentioned it to a bunch of scientists and trainers, and they were like, whoa, I did not know that. The biggest, like when someone has good genetics, you hear that all the time with yeah. usually people who are not the biggest guy in the gym, and the guy's making an excuse of why he's not. Oh, my genetics just aren't good. Or maybe you lift like shit. Um or maybe you don't eat enough protein or, or, you know, well, there's a lot of different reasons, but it is obvious that there's some people that respond very well to weight training and others, no response at all. In fact, in a muscle protein synthesis study uh, done in 2003, uh, I forget the researcher's name. It was in the first chapter. Okay. The first chapter. Uh, 23% of people can't stimulate any protein synthesis in muscle at all ever <laughs> adults now it gets even worse uh because the problem the biggest genetic difference is not hormonal levels as a lot of people would guess there's actually only one person since the dawn of time who's been barred from professional sports because her testosterone level was naturally too high. Wow. It's only happened one time. Yeah, I saw that. It's never happened with a male. Did you read that part? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And so people really don't have, now people have suppressed testosterone levels when they get older, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about world-class athletes. So they're probably not going to be missing, you know, the most anabolic hormone that the body creates. So they're kind of all the same. So the biggest difference is tendon layout. Now, when somebody, you look at like the, the you look at the regular person. When you go to bench press, your, your pectorals attach to the sternum. And then the insertion point on the bone of action is on the humerus. And it's usually right underneath the bicep. So right here for those people watching on video. Yeah. Now, and its job is to bring the humerus bone across the body, right? So if you're pressing, it's you know, across the body. So a narrow grip bench press, you're going to target the pectorals much more than a wide grip. Wide grip just looks cool because you look like you can handle more weight, but you're just kidding yourself, 
Um, so I see people doing extremely wide grip, and it's just like you're just gonna hurt yourself, you idiot. Uh, okay. So the um, you know, it's like putting a Ferrari emblem on a Honda. <laughs> Not really doing. It. You're just right. pretending. And, but they allow it in competition, so I guess I I shouldn't be that critical of it. But then again, why? Yeah. Grab it shoulder width and really use your chest. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, the um, when you look at the insertion points, so like like most of us have that insertion right here, but guys that are pro athletes. It's here. It's at the other end of the bicep. It's at, it's right by the elbow. So they have a longer, what's called a lever arm. Now, I realize we're talking about a human arm and a lever arm, and those are two different things, but they both happen to be going on in the human arm. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so bear with me on the, on the nomenclature here. It's, I didn't come up with these names. Yeah. Uh, but, when you look at that leverage, what does that mean to the person who's lifting weights? That means the person who has the further tendon attachment has more leverage. Therefore, they're going to have a stronger, weaker range. So they can engage more muscle mm. in the weaker range than they can in the stronger range. Now, this is documented, this has been documented for 20 years. This is the genetic difference that people complain about. There are some people who just, and the reason the people who can't create any muscle protein synthesis at all, I can tell you they don't have that mutation. They don't have that insertion point out here. They have it on the other side. Right. So, you know, one of the biggest things that if people hear weightlifting is a waste of time, they're, they're, one of their arguments is going to be like, Okay, let's walk into the gym and see all these people lifting weights and see the people who are jacked and that, and that sort of thing. Are the people who are in the weight in the weight room and crush it in there? Do are is most of them have the longer lever or what? What what's the explanation in regards to like? If, if I got, you I got to an, answer, answer that question. Part answer to that question. Number yeah. one, um, I don't see anybody jacked. I think they're fooling themselves. I mean, you got to go to like Venice Beach to actually see and shape people. You go to the average Planet Fitness, and the people who are in there are no different than the people at the Pizza Hut next door. <laughs> so I would say they're getting nothing. And this is like 99% of the population. So, I mean, when a question is based on an observation of an outlier, it's like, how dumb are you? Like, that's not normal. That guy's not normal. Like, why are we even talking about it? Let's look at what the, the randomized controlled trial had to say, which is why you never want to look at like one, you know, case, you know, like yeah. why isn't everybody as good of a boxer as Mike Tyson? Because <laughs> he's different a lot genetically. Um, so I, I don't, I don't particularly care for that, but I would say almost nobody's in shape. Like if you really look at, look at averages, like just a bunch of fat slobs in the gym and outside the gym, it just, same people everywhere you look. So, uh, but I would also say, yeah, those people who tend to, I, I went to high school with a guy, his name was Mark Demarest. Like, dude was just an animal. Yeah. He picked up weight and he just mutated right in front of all of us. Right. Like, it was like, I mean, the guy was benching 405 for reps when Jeez. he was set, 16. That's insane. Yeah. Just an absolute animal yeah and uh you know i didn't i didn't give him an mri but uh, i mean i was a high school student but you know it's like we're all asking like what are you doing man and he's like i don't know like like i eat co co cocoa puffs for breakfast like what do you, what do you want to know like i just do the same shit you guys do yeah. and the guy was just growing he was so ridiculously strong and so now knowing that the genetic difference is really boiled down to one thing. There's other, there's one other thing, which is birth weight, but that also contributes to how big of a human being you're going to be. So you're, you're born like a 12 pound baby. You're probably going to look like, you know, one of the guys on, 
the world's strongest man. You know, you might be six foot seven and 320 pounds and pretty lean. Uh, but that's different. That's being just a giant person. But the actual ability to build muscle really has to do with the tendon layout. And so, yeah, I believe some of the people that have an easier time. But what does X3 do? It takes that geometry of weak versus strong range out of the equation. Right. So now everybody has the same ability to grow naturally, just like these NFL guys I work with. I work with 16 NFL players right now. And uh, they all had that mutation. They're all growing faster because they're using X3 exclusively now. Mm -hmm. So that's that's incredibly powerful because even they are at a disadvantage in the weak range. Yeah. And so we have now normalized that. So everybody can get the same access to muscle tissue because like, like all the time, like people quote the fat free mass index, which is a bullshit study uh, because they, they imagine that study imagines that you reach your muscular potential at 16 years old. Yeah. I saw that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite parts in the book because that is like a standard study that's quoted all the time when somebody is sort of, you know, called out for using performance enhancing drugs. And it's just like, yeah, they're bigger and stronger than a 16 year old. So yeah. is my girlfriend. You know, <laughs> I mean, like, we don't want. That's just yeah. the stupidest study I've ever, I've ever read. But apparently nobody in the peer review uh, uh, commission like had a problem with that, which also shows you back in the nineties, how sports science and sports performance, they were this far apart. And now they're this far apart. Yeah. They're, they're not in. Gotcha. Okay. I want, I want to make a little bit of the, yeah, no, I mean, some of the, some studies are obviously ridiculous and we'll, we'll get in. I, I want to get into a little bit of kind of why that is in, in a minute, but I want to kind of jump into nutrition stuff. Um, because you have def definitely very, I would say probably very unique habits in regards to your nutritional practices on a, on a daily basis and, you know, somewhat unique beliefs in regards to what is, what is appropriate, what is proper for, for, for human beings, you know, especially with freaking something like game changers coming out, not a year ago or whatever it is. Um, so I want you to just, I, I guess, take a, take a minute or two talking about kind of starting with your nutritional routine and then kind of like backtracking as to kind of why that is for just a couple minutes. So I, I try and make the point as often as it's convenient to, that I don't really have any opinions. I'm going to do what the scientific literature says. Yeah. Um, because if one day, like the most impressive study I've ever read says eating cauliflower all day, every day, only that is going to make you bigger and leaner and stronger. I'll switch to that. No, I already know that's not going to happen, but I'm just saying if it did, yeah. And it was a legit study. I'd be like, wow, okay, well, that just turns my world upside down and I'm eating something different tonight. But um, what I wanted to do is after coming out with sort of the world's most powerful muscular stimulus device, I wanted to make sure everybody was super successful with it. So I have to recommend a, a, a good nutrition program. So I could have just taken the easy way out and just taking whatever was the most popular diet he just say do keto read dave asprey's book you know like that's it i could have just done that and then it's kind of what i was alluding to in the first couple of weeks and then i stopped talking about it for like like six months because i was really irritated when i read like comparisons of different types of diets and and the fact that oxalates are completely ignored like you know, yeah. plants poison you, all of them, give you a low grade poison because they want you to stop eating at some point. Uh, so they give you fructose, which is addictive, but then they also give you a poison, which makes you stop. Makes sense from the plant's perspective, but is that really what our biochemistry needs? The conclusion I came to was no. And also there are two uncontested statements that have been made in the academic literature 
about long life. And those two statements are high level of muscular strength and low level of body fat. Those are going to drive the longest life. Wow. So and no study has ever said like less muscle mass is going to lead right. you to, uh, to a longer life. Even if it did, I would ignore that because, you know, it, yeah, I, just me. I like to be strong. Uh, so like, like when, when, when listening to that, it's like, okay, well, a vegan can't live longer than a carnivore because they're weak. Yeah. Well, and so like to, to kind of spit, you know, you said the, the two, st like two studies are, uh, you know, more muscle or more musculature and, um, less body fat. That's like, you know, a, a study that's not just looking at like, it's, it's an all inclusive study. It's not just being like, well, these people well, lift for. weights and are strong. Oh, all cause mortality is what we exactly call the study. Yeah. All cause any, mortality. Any fucking reason somebody's going to die, you know, whether they're going to have a drug overdose or you know whatever. Like what? What kind of people? Like because if you get a large enough sample size in a study like that, then all the anomalies wash out. Yeah. Uh, and, and what you really get is like okay, you know, so the people who are stronger, they they live longer. The people who are leaner live longer. So you got to be lean and strong. But yeah, those are those are very telling studies. The problem is there you just got to have a huge sample size for them. It's tough to collect that data. Yeah. Uh, so d you know, dive into a little bit of what your uh, your nutritional day looks like. Okay. Um, well, right now I'm uh, putting more emphasis on the on the bacterial uh, fermentation. So I take four doses of Fortigen, uh, and then um, I'm also doing, I mean, you want to know what I'm doing? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I want to know it. I'm only eating one meal a day. So I hydrate and uh, get, get a set amount of carbohydrates. I do it before the workout because I've noticed some complaints customers that they get a little heartburn or they do it right after the workout and nobody likes that. So do it before the workout and then, uh, and I, I, I do about 80 grams of carbohydrates. So that's not much, no. but it immediately goes back into muscle glycogen. And then I'll, I'll get like two liters of water in an hour and a half, and then I'll do my workout. So, so, and I've been dry fasting for 20 hours before that. Yeah. So no food, no water. So very quickly I go back to hydration, but because the muscle has so much demand for the glycogen, which is coming with the now better hydrated blood. Um, yeah, I can just see my face like sinking in during the workout because all of that is going into the musculature. Wow. Yeah, I just look like a cadaver. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then what I do, uh, and then I try and eat my meal very, very soon, which is like, it only has to be like a pound of meat now, but it often ends up being a little bit more just because, you know, extra protein just puts you in a higher thermogenic place. And what kind of, and what kind of meat? Red meat, just steak. Uh, I usually go for, all depends on where I am because I'm yeah. usually in the home, so... Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to eat every meal at Texas Roadhouse, but um, or or a nice like like Morton's or something like that. But um, sometimes it's um, burger patties from McDonald's. Okay. Wow. Um, just to be honest, actually McDonald's is very high quality beef, uh, and they made that change I don't know, like twenty years ago or something like that. Okay. But they never really advertised it because every time McDonald's says we did something healthy, they'll be like. Nobody gives him credit for that. By some, by some fake news jerks who will say that they're fraudulent in their claim and have no evidence to back it up. Wow. Or they'll all refer to each other, uh, which is equally bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So McDonald's doesn't, I know an ex uh, executive there. Uh, okay. And it's a shame because most McDonald's beef is grass fed for the majority of its life. Wow. It's actually, yeah, it's actually really good. Quality. I did not know that. 
It's just like it's like, oh my God, I'm eating like you know amazing beef. You are. They didn't they didn't like sprinkle it with sugar. It's just wow. good beef. Yeah. Awesome. Um I think one of the before I get to the last a uh, couple questions, I really want you to talk about the importance of quality of, of quality protein because you know there's a lot of people who think in order to gain muscle mass they have to have a surplus of calories when really it's uh a surplus of good quality protein. Yeah. Um, and so I guess kind of, kind of riff on that a little bit and talk sure. and talk about your opinions, thoughts around like not needing carbohydrates. Okay. Um, yeah. First the protein, there's a couple of studies. I got that one ends real quick. There's a number of studies that show if you have a protein surplus and a calorie deficit, you lose body fat and gain muscle mass at the same time. So that's all anybody really needs to know. And that aligns with everyone's goals. Nobody goes to their trainer and says, you know, I'd really like to be fatter and weaker. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> like they all want to be leaner and stronger. So yeah. protein surplus and calorie deficit. And so like when I do four doses of Fortigen, that's 200 grams of protein. Then, you know, I get another 50 or 100 with, uh, with meat at dinner. I don't really need anything else, but my entire, you know, calorie consumption in a day might be a thousand calories. Wow. And real quick, just so everybody knows what you're talking about, Fortigen is y'all's product. Talk. Fermentation product. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's just the most efficient protein. Uh, it was originally developed to treat muscle wasting in cancer patients. Mm. And uh, then I, kind of grabbed it and talked to the guys who developed the original formula and was like, okay, I'm going to come out with something that's targeted at, at uh, to, you know, to be anabolic as opposed to anti-catabolic. Right. And uh, they were reluctant because they didn't think much of the fitness industry, which neither do I. Uh, so it's okay. I understood why, where they were coming from, but the, um, you know, they, they just, they didn't like the sort of anti-science attitudes of the fitness industry, I guess. So, mm. so instead I had to really like, you know, compensate them up front yeah. because they, they didn't think really go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but they were, yeah, it has really gone somewhere. That's the, that's the, we got, we got like tens of thousands of people on monthly subscriptions. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so talk about the, the, you know, like that's, that's super high quality protein. You talk about red meat, you know, good, uh, you know, good red meat is good quality protein and talk about why it's quality rather than simply quantity in regards to like some, so many people just think they have to get to a certain grams of protein every single day to be able to, to grow. But when really quality is super, super important as well. So it has to do with the usability. So most, like if somebody slugs down 50 grams of whey protein, they really only got nine grams. Yeah. Because the, because the makeup of the whey protein is not the right ratio of essential amino acids. So when you ingest protein, it gets all taken apart into the separate amino acids. And there's 20, eight of them are essential, really seven, because the eighth one's kind of everywhere. So nobody really, it's like, yeah, it's essential, but you can wait a month to get some of that. And you're like, fine, like nothing happens. Cause so it's not needed for protein synthesis is, is my point. So you have these seven essentials and then, um, and then the other ones, your body can make themselves. It can make them themselves with other protein. It ingests other mineral protein. It can disassemble and then reassemble into a complete protein. Or it can do it via, like if you're fasted, which I so often am, uh, in fact, the majority of the time I'm fasted. So uh, it can break down unused protein in the body, like scar tissue, which I have a lot of. So it can, like, I don't know if you can see it, but I used to have my fraternity letters branded on my arm. Oh, well, yeah, I can't. It It would stick up so high. And you can barely see it now. Yeah. Just wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, so my body has been eating the scar tissue from the inside to produce muscle protein synthesis. Wow. In a fasting state. So it's like, and then, and then dry fasting accelerates autophagy. So like I get there a lot quicker than most people. Mm. Um, Question, did, that, so, did, did it, um, what was it? Sorry, I know I kind of cut you off, but I'm, I'm interested before I forget is the, the 20 hour dry fast, is that something that you had to kind of gradually work towards slash like how difficult or not difficult is it for you now? Um, I'm probably the worst guy to ask because I have incredible will. Okay. Like, you know, um, I'm going to run an experiment where uh, uh, it's just the hyperplasia experiment where they, they put a bird in a stretched pectoral position uh for like eight hours wow to see if they could just stretch the shit out of the muscle and see if that would accelerate the growth it did a lot and that's part of what wow. we're doing but we stretch for 15 seconds they stretch it yeah. for like eight hours Jeez. i'm actually planning on going like a couple hours not eight you personally be, yeah yeah i want to be in a brutally stretched position for a very extended period of time. Like something so you're like, just, you're just going to be like this for a couple hours. Yep. Jeez. Yeah. And uh, like, but I, I gotta, I gotta get to like, um, you know, like a, like a CAT scan or something where I can really like see the mass in 3d. Yeah. And then do it right after and see like if, if there was a change so i gotta work out right before that long stretch so because i want to see uh and, and interesting the the top protein researcher in the world um his uh his name is professor jose antonio he's at uh florida state he this was his dissertation project right yeah i saw that stretching the birds yeah that's, that's crazy yeah, and and I mean he loves talking about it, but he, he I don't think he thinks that it's going to be nearly as effective with humans because like there's a practicality of stretching for a certain amount of time, but yeah, you why not why not test it out? Yeah, but you know my my point when I read that is yeah you haven't met me yet because yeah. I'll do it right. Well, and, and, I'm and just for the see. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and for those of you uh, listening who probably don't, might not know what hyperplasia is in, in regards to just like getting bigger muscles, there's hypertrophy, which is essentially getting the muscle fibers bigger. And then the hyperplasia is essentially multiplying the number of muscle fibers, splitting the fiber, muscle fibers and, and increasing the number. The cells start to divide, which is a more permanent growth. And also remember from standard hypertrophy, there's two types. There's sarcoplasmic and myofibril. Right. And most people, like the 23%, who never get any muscle protein synthesis, no matter what they do, they can have an effect. They can have a sarcoplasmic effect. They can store more fuel in the cell, which does make a muscle bigger as well. Mm. Uh, but, you know, not that much. Yeah. Like it's, gotcha. Those are the people who grow for two weeks. You know, when they're like in high school and they start lifting and then no more growth, like forever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to come from the standpoint of the, I feel like the plant-based community has probably only grown and grown and multiplied and gotten more and more exponential in regards to the people behind it over the last crap, five years, 10 years, one year. What is like the main argument that you hear from those kinds of people trying to defend their point of view in regards to like, look, we'll just keep it, try to keep it simple and on one topic in regards to like protein and the usability of protein. Cause there's so many people who claim like that animal protein sources are not as, are not better than, than plant protein sources when a lot of most people will say otherwise. Um, and I, I believe otherwise as well. But what is their but plant-based community's main argument in regards to plant plants are just as good of a protein source? They don't really have one. They just keep 
you know, they're they're like the the people on the popular side of politics right now, where they can just scream nonsense and then call you a racist if you want to argue with them. It's kind of like that. Gotcha. Like, you know, well, ultimately, like, you try and argue scientifically, and then they're like, "You're a murderer," and you're like, "I thought we were having a scientific conversation." Mm-hmm. And by the way, vegetable farming. And keep in mind, there's only like two percent of the population that's vegan right now. Vegetable farming kills 7 billion animals a year in the United States. Wow. Poisoned birds, poison gophers, ground squirrels, chipmunks. Uh, every deer that gets into a vineyard gets shot. I used to watch that happen. I had a, when I was growing up, I had a view of a vineyard. Wow. And uh, on the edge of like a redwood forest, Napa Valley. Um, yeah, I saw deer getting blown away every morning. Jeez. Jeez. Probably not every morning. Real close. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 7 billion animals are destroyed for the sake of vegetable farming. Like, you take to farm all these vegetables, it takes huge pieces of land, which animals would like to walk across and eat from. You're not going to train them. So, like, what's good for nature has got nothing to do with what our optimum nutrition is because every species that expands into the territory of another species is destroying the habitat of something. Yeah. 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 I mean, why do you have a population explosion of mice one year, which is immediately followed by a population explosion of rattlesnakes? That happened when I was yeah. living in that. Wow. I remember one year it was like, you look down the driveway and you'd see six of them sunning themselves at like sundown. Jeez. You're Jeez. Like, wow. Like what a dangerous place we live. No, it was just that year. It was just that summer. Wow. Wow. Um, second to last question I want to ask is so many people in who are nutrition experts back up their findings, opinions, thoughts on research studies. And it is so hard to determine causation from a study because it's so hard to isolate, um, you know, one particular thing as causation. Correlation happens all the time. Exactly, exactly. So I, I don't even really necessarily know what exactly the question that I want to get across is, to be honest with you, but I want to know as to like, what like talk about the importance of needing to really like dive super deep into studies and not just jump to conclusions just because there is some sort of correlation somewhere when it actually is not the causation at all i think i know what you well you're a little bit of what you're asking about is confirmation bias right yeah exactly every researcher uh suffers from that because what do you research things you're interested in why are you interested in them probably a whole host of reasons but you you know when you when you have a question about something that you care about you may want one answer but get another one so you got to make sure that the question you're not asking that the question you are asking is not an exercise of pleasing yourself with an answer that you predetermined. Yeah. So what a lot of people subconsciously do when they do research is they'll they'll say, this is the answer I want. What data do I need to prove that answer? That's confirmation bias. And uh, you have to you have to say, well, like we just need to find out the real answer. Now I think it's different when a researcher is personally in, invested in something versus professionally invested in something because when you're personally invested it's just your opinion it's just you know what what makes you sleep well at night when you're professionally invested in it you need to be right because you need to have people who are definitely in either side they're definitely not going to like your results right yeah and you need to be able to speak with absolute conviction to defend your results. Otherwise, you're just a shitty scientist. Mm-hmm. So when I do research, like it doesn't really matter what the outcome is. Uh, 
it's got to be the right answer. It's got to be what really happened. And if if I see something unexpected, then I seek to explain why. And yeah. then go, okay, well, why, you know, why didn't it work for this group of people, but it did for that other group of people? What's different about them? You know, maybe, maybe one group of people couldn't assimilate protein or something. You know, I mean, we're speaking generically, so yeah. it could be all sorts of things. Um, yeah, it sounds like, you know, when, when you do research or when people who do research from like, uh, a not, they don't have any sort of other mo like financial motivation or other or professional motivation, you know, you, you seek to find the truth. A lot of people will seek to find an answer to the, will seek to find a causation for the answer that they want. Right. Like one of the most searched things in nutrition, and I actually did the analysis looking at keywords like, like, Weight loss without changing my diet. <laughs> one of the most common things searched for that comes after weight loss. That's insane, yeah. You know, with like no dietary change or no, no change to my diet. It was like the most yeah. popular. And it's the same thing. It was like weight loss without exercise or, you know, those sorts of things. Right, right. And so really what people are looking for is pizza, Twinkies, and ice cream. And then somehow that's going to be healthy. And I think a lot of diets, the ones that promote cheat days or whatever, like you can just see like every like totally food addicted person. Like, oh yeah, and somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm doing a cheat day. I was at a barbecue, not this past summer, but the one before that, before we had all this pandemic nonsense. Uh, the um, bunch of people at barbecue and this, this, this guy, pretty thin guy and he got a lot thinner and people he was talking about his diet and you know it was like cheat day this cheat day that and oh my god i have like strawberry shortcake or whatever and uh this uh, it was a it was a barbecue at a good friend's house but this guy he was not going to be another good friend this guy i wanted to like throw him on the fucking roof like he was really annoying me and i'm like you yeah you know, finally i just had to go you, you realize you're wrong about like everything you said right like you just found some shit where you're at a caloric deficit, but you're still eating junk food. Yeah. Like I think that's healthy. And then he's yeah. like, you know, he already looked at me and looked kind of looked me up and down and was like, oh fuck, I'm not gonna win an argument with this yeah. guy. And yeah, you know, well, just kind of away, but I just like, man, like, why are you fooling yourself? Yeah. Like. Well, and so, so many people, so many people think that health is strict and like they think that health is strictly what you see on the outside, you know, like he got thinner. And so he thought like, oh, I got to be healthy. But it's like, it's not just on the outside, bro. Right. It could mean you have cancer. <laughs> yeah. cancer gets going. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're doing great. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, no doubt. No <laughs> doubt. He's trying to take it to the extreme with the with the example, so people are like, "Yeah, yeah. You're right." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, this has been awesome. Before I ask the last question here, uh, Doctor Jay Quish, I want to acknowledge you for being that truth seeker that that you are for coming coming to, into the fitness industry, essentially from the point of view from like, I'm trying to seek out the truth. I want to figure out what actually is the optimal way to live longer. What's the optimal way for muscle growth and for fat loss and that sort of thing. And um, you've definitely sought out the truth where a lot of people have some sort of other kind of motivation. And I think it's really, really unique for sure. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, y'all need to make sure you go uh, read this book. You're going to definitely learn a lot and it will definitely, uh, make you want to learn more and want you to uh, to learn a little bit deeper. Weightlifting is a waste of time. So is cardio. And there's a better way to have the body you want. Um, I've got probably eight pages of notes on the book myself. I'll have that linked up in the show notes. You also need to make sure you go uh, follow Dr. Jay Quish on Instagram and, and everything like that. And I'll have that linked up in the show notes. I get a landing page for that. And you can also uh, order the, you can get to the Amazon uh, book page from, from that page, it's drj.com, D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter J.com. You can find every find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. Yep. 
Yep, I will have it all uh, linked up in the show notes for sure. So everybody uh, need to make sure you go check that out. I'm definitely going to uh, continue to dive deeper into your research and t- continue to dive deeper in everything that you're working on and uh, might just order the X3 myself. So we'll see what happens. Um, but last question here, Dr. Jayquish, is I think that getting closer to the best version of yourself is a, a constant journey. And I also think it's a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is a little bit different than the way that you're going to get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or three things that you can currently work on to get closer to that best version of Dr. John Jake, which that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you would currently do or currently work on? So I'm always trying to come to a better level of understanding of mm-hmm. everything I talk about. So I review all the points that I, that I espouse and want to reinforce them with newer research. I also want to see newer research that can potentially help me condense some of these points. Because if, you know, if there's a randomized clinical trial on my product specifically, that's going to speak volumes. And I can use the other 16 studies as support to that. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, I'm always like looking to refine the argument and I, I, I won't say necessarily i'll say simplify but not oversimplify because oversimplify is another word for wrong yeah Yeah. Uh, right i mean like everybody wants their nutritional advice summed up in a meme and it's like it's just it's it's too complicated for that you can't do that um so always getting better and um Also, always testing what I'm doing. Mm. Like whatever, like what I'm doing right now, I've run a bunch of tests on from all, all, all variables independently tested. So first it was fasting, then it was dry fasting. And you know, then it was uh, started off eating three pounds of meat a day in one meal. And that's tough. Sitting down eating three pounds of meat. That last half pound, you're not loving it. I don't care where you are. You can be the best steakhouse in the world. You're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's that. Uh, And and so I tested replacing the bulk of my protein need with the bacterial fermentation with Fortigen. That was a smashing success. And uh, and so I I was able to, to pull that off. And Every time I make one of these alterations, there's just a huge jump in the way I look and how I, you know, I'm carrying less body fat and more, uh, more muscle and um, you know, always, always trying to get better. And uh, this is another thing I share with the NFL players that I work with, because when they get in the league, they kind of think, all right, well, you know, I'm good. And uh, this, is, this is what I am. And they're not really, they're worried about the, the next game and studying the strategy and they're not so much worried about getting better because they don't really think they can. Right. right. And they definitely can. There's mindset work to do and, and, uh, and they, they can become faster. They can become stronger. They can build their tendons and ligaments. Another thing, when I mentioned heavy, there's no, no getting away from heavy. Uh, tendons and ligaments grow at multiples of body weight. Like you've got to put huge wow. loads on the you will get this out of X3. You will not get it with weights. Yeah, yeah. you can't go heavy enough. So uh, that that's that's another another uh, huge thing. And, and I also think just being the third thing, being just analytical about every habit I have, every little thing I do. Um, I discovered something like uh, I got an espresso machine for Christmas. Somebody gave it to me. It's an awful nice gift. <laughs> They're expensive. Uh, but uh, so I got this espresso machine and I always love an espresso, but it was probably like once every six months I'd have one because yeah. yeah. I could make my own coffee in the morning or or have an Imperium, which is a, like a pre-workout coffee replacement thing that we make. Um, and I got this espresso machine and I'm like thinking wow, this is delightful and I'm taking in much less fluid. So is there a future here? Could I maybe create something that's super condensed, you know, almost like a paste 
Right. right. I was like really liking this idea until I discovered how acidic that shit is on an empty yeah. stomach. Yeah. 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 It's not your friend. Like I, uh, I probably gave myself a small ulcer. Wow. Uh, I was playing with it since Christmas. And so I'm not using the espresso machine at the moment. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm, but I run these little experiments. And I try and test them to the failure point to see like, you know, cause, cause other people will say, well, if a double espresso is good, I'll have a quadruple. Yeah. 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 <laughs> people do that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so just like running these little experiments and, and then, um, now, you know, now I'm learning how to heal the lining of my stomach, uh, which has been a nice adventure. Like I'm learning a lot from that too, but also I have a habit of learning things that are not very well documented. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I have to, I have to take multiple studies that are about aspects of the dysfunction and then write up inference. So I write up like a paragraph where I draw this data point, this data point, this data point, and if these are all true, they, you know, like, like these are all true, therefore, uh, and then I then I come up with like something a little more conclusionary, which is more helpful uh -huh. for people. So that that constantly sharpening the saw, constantly going back and going, okay, well, this is what we know, and uh, let's test a, another aspect. So the diet I just laid out for you sounds pretty simple. But I've been working on that for years. Yeah. 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 And then I also have like people who I know are as disciplined as I am. Usually bodybuilders have crazy discipline. And so I'm like, I want you to run this experiment for me. And uh, yeah, like the latest, the latest thing that I have going on is really effective. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm just totally lean, bigger and stronger than ever feel super have a mental focus every day. Cause another thing like people who fast like intermittently, but by day, you know, like one day they fast. So they do like 48 hours of no food and then they eat the rest of the week. It's like, okay, so your brain's only working one day a week yeah. at optimum. That sucks. Uh, one or two days, depending on when you put your meal. <clears throat> uh, well, if you eat one meal a day, by the time you reach the end of your day, you are like, like I'd say the latter half, crazy focus every day. Yeah. And I like that a lot. Yeah. Well, I love how uh, I love how deliberate you are around being analytical around your research, around your products, and around your own personal habits. It's awesome, man. And I uh, I appreciate your time today. But that's all we got. <laughs>